Hey fellow SweetScript developers, Eric from Stoic Software here again. In this video, we are going to explore the event lifecycle of a NetSuite record. Uh, my intention here is to give you a better idea of the triggers that you have at your disposal during record manipulation. Before we get started on that, if you would like to become a competent, confident SweetScript developer yourself, you can get started right now with my free email course on the best resources for learning SweetScript. You will find a link at the top of the description. All right, let's get started. There are two very important script types in the eventing lifecycle of a NetSuite record. Uh, the first is the user event, which is uh, it runs server side and responds to uh, various database triggers, if you will. I've covered the user event in a in more detail on a separate playlist, which you'll find linked here in the video. And the other script, important script type, is the client script, which runs client side in the user's browser. And we use that to respond to the user's interactions with the record form in the user interface. Now these two scripts are intertwined and they each play a separate role uh, in record manipulation. So first we're gonna just briefly talk through these various events um, and more so how they relate to each other, how they flow together, how they sequence. Um, but we won't talk about them in too much detail uh, in terms of what you might be able to use them for. Uh, that's more up to you and your specific project and for topics of another time. <laughs> so to get started, let's take the example of the user loading a record in the UI uh, to edit it. So the first thing that happens is anytime a record is loaded out of the database, the before load event will trigger in any user events uh, deployed to that record. So this gives us a chance on the server side, uh, no matter what is triggering the record to be loaded out of the database, whether it's a user in the UI or uh, maybe a CSV import, uh, another script, could be any of those things. Um, whenever the record is loaded out of the database, before load will trigger. Once before load completes successfully on the server side, the record data is passed to the user's browser, to the client side. And just as the form finishes loading, but before the user has any control and can start changing fields, the page init event will fire on the client side. So that's another option we have to manipulate the record before the user has control. So at this point, the form is fully loaded in the UI, and now the user is ready to start making changes. So as they change fields, uh, there's a series of field events that will fire, validate field, field changed, and potentially post sourcing. We will look at all of these with a little example here in a little bit to better illustrate. And then uh, as the user adds lines, changes lines, anything uh, sublist related, there are a series of sublist events that get fired, uh, including line init, validate line, validate insert, validate delete, and sublist changed. Now lastly, once the user has changed all the fields, added any lines they want to, uh, they're ready to save the record and store their new data in the database. So the first thing they do is click the save button in the UI, which triggers the save record event on the client side. So the save record event is basically our last chance to validate the record, the user's data before the record makes it to the database. So once save record completes successfully, uh, all of the new data is packaged up, sent over to the server side, and that will trigger before submit in our user event. 
So before submit runs, after the user has clicked save in the UI, after control has returned to the server side, but before the new data is actually stored in the database. Once before submit completes successfully, all of the new data is stored in the database, and then after submit gets fired. Now let's take a look at these and actually illustrate them in practice. So what I have done is I have made one of each script type, the user event on the right and the client script on the left. Uh, and all I have done, I've added a, a, an event handler for every event type possible in each script. And the only thing they're responsible for doing is logging some information. So in our user event scripts, we log just a quick message of which event got triggered and what the type, the event type is. So that's what all three server side user events do. And it looks very similar on the client side. Um, the page init will tell us that page init was triggered and what the mode was. Uh, the validate field, field changed, and post sourcing will all tell us which one got triggered and for which field it's triggering. Our sublist events will log again a message of which one got triggered and which sublist is being modified. And lastly, our save record will tell us when it gets triggered. Now you'll notice a pattern here in save record and all of the other validate methods, we are returning true, but we're not doing that everywhere. So in all of the validation style events, validate field, validate insert, validate line, validate delete, and save record, in all of those validation style functions, NetSuite expects us to return a Boolean value. And then it will inspect that value to determine whether to allow the change being requested or prevent it. So whenever we return true, uh, that will allow the change to go through. And whenever we return false, that will prevent the change from taking place, whatever that change might be. So for now, I'm going to return false from the save record just so we can stop before control gets returned to the server. So I have already deployed both of these scripts to the sales order record. So let's see them in action. I'm going to create a new sales order. Open the browser console. What you'll see right as the form finishes loading, you see our page init got triggered. If we go back to the user event and refresh our logs there, the before load was also triggered with a type of create. So the type, uh, the type in the user event and the mode in the client script tell us what action is being taken by the user. Are they creating a record? Are they copying one, editing one, etc.? Uh, so we can use that input to determine or to vary our response based on the type of action. Uh, the same before load will still fire. Let's go we'll look at the list of sales orders. <laughs> Just to compare, when I view a sales order, I've pulled a sales order up in view mode, I haven't changed anything, I can't change anything, and I refresh the logs, here's our before load triggered again, but this time in view mode. Okay, so our form is loaded, we are ready to start editing. And let's take a look at what happens when we change a field. No 
notice that over on the right in the console, nothing is happening as I type. And nothing is changing, no events are firing as I type. But as soon as I either tab out of the field or click out of the field, as soon as the field loses focus, that's where it will fire the field events. So we hit tab. And we can see that validate field triggered, then field changed triggered. And the field ID we're getting is other ref num. And if we look at the PO num number, we can see that its field ID is other ref num. So as the field changes, the first thing that happens, validate field fires. Since our validate field always returns true, NetSuite allows that change to happen. And we move on and field changed gets fired as our new value gets committed to the field. So that's a very simple example of what happens when uh, we change the field value. Now you'll see if I click in and click out, let's clear the console here and get this. So if I click in, I don't change anything and I click out, validate field still fires. But since the field did not, since the value did not change, field changed does not also fire. So field change will only fire if the value uh, changes. So now let's look at a more complicated field. When we change the customer on a sales order, there are a whole host of other fields that change subsequently. And you can see the console on the right just scrolling as several other fields uh, begin to change. So if we scroll way back up, all the way up here was our validate field for the entity. Entity being the customer field. So all in between all of these are the dependent fields of entity. So things like to be printed, to be faxed, to be emailed, the shipping address, shipping method, um, all of those types of things start to change when we change the customer. So it has several dependent fields and that is where the post sourcing event comes in. So way up here, what you'll notice is that first validate field fires on the field we're changing, on the customer. But then we start changing all the dependent fields. So, and you'll notice a pattern of alternating validate field, field changed. So to be printed uh, is first, we, we validate it, then change it, then to be faxed, validate it, change it, etc. And we keep alternating all the way down through several dependent fields. Okay, all the way down here to the next time. So after all of our dependent fields have changed, post sourcing fires on our entity field, and field change fires as the new change gets committed. You can see right at the end here, the nexus field changes, and that is triggering these tax related fields to change. So uh, basically the post sourcing and, and the field change events are recursive. So they continue to fire for all dependent fields um, and then wrap up back at the field that initiated the change. So those are the field level events. Now we want to go to look at the line level events. So when I add An item. So I set the item, which triggered our normal field level events, validate field, field change. So those still fire on our uh, sublist fields as well. And you can see it went all the way down. We changed several dependent fields and lastly post sourcing fires on our item. Great. When I click add, let's clear this. When I click add, can see that validate line 
gets fired. So validate line happens after we add a new line or edit an existing one. Uh, we fire validate line first, since that, again, in our code always returns true. Uh, the script allows the change to happen, commits the line, then sublist changed fires. And since in the UI, once we add the line, NetSuite automatically moves focus to the next line, uh, then line init fires for that line. So we're gonna close that, clear that. Once I select the existing line again, we can see that line init fires right away. So anytime a line gains focus, the line init event will fire for that line. Now let's see, let's add a second line here. And what happens when I insert a line in between them? So when I selected the line, again, I get line init. I click insert. The first thing that happens is that validate insert gets fired. Uh, clicking insert effectively commits a change on the line where the button was clicked. So that is where sublist changed fires. And then line init triggers for the new, the line that I'm inserting. Inserted line six there, and now I want to remove it. So when I click remove, you can see the first thing that happens, validate delete gets triggered. Uh, then the line is removed and sublist changed fires, and subsequently line init as the focus is brought to this new line. So those are all of our line level events. And so now I've changed all the fields, I've added the lines that I want to, and I am ready to save the record. When I click save, you can see that it got triggered, but nothing happened, right? It didn't actually save, and I can keep clicking and you'll keep seeing the counter go up here, but nothing's happening. And that is because we are returning false, which is basically saying, always stop the record from being saved. Let's fix that, repair it, Oops, client script. And briefly there at the bottom, you would have seen the save triggered, but now you can see that it's spinning and it did save our record. So once save record completes successfully, let's look at our user event. And we can see that before submit and after submit got triggered with the type of create. So as we created the new record, stored it in the database, before submit fired, then after submit, these are in descending uh, time order. And then since NetSuite automatically takes us back to view mode, before load fires as well. Now, one thing I see a lot of developers trying to do is follow the same validation pattern that the client side events do, where if I return false, that will stop the event from happening. That is not uh, a universal pattern that is only applicable to a few different events on the client side. So a lot of times I see developers trying to uh, return false from before submit to stop the record from being committed to the database, and that does not work. And that suite does not care what you return from any of the user event functions. It doesn't inspect it at all. It doesn't expect you to return anything. Uh, so it doesn't matter what you return. Returning from these uh, user event functions does nothing. Instead, I suppose we can uh, we can prove that. So my before submit is returning false. And if this were to behave like the client script validation events, we would not be allowed to save our sales order. So I'm gonna edit, I'm not gonna make any changes, I'll just save it. 
and we can see the UI tells us it saved successfully. And we can see more, uh, we can see an additional before submit, after submit combination now. So returning false from our user event before submit did nothing to stop the record from being committed to the database. But since uh, we're not always creating records through the UI, sometimes we do CSV imports, sometimes uh, maybe another script is creating them, there are times where we want to enforce some validation logic and uh, prevent the record from being saved. In our user rents, the only way to do that is to throw an exception. Now, exception handling and throwing and good error management is uh, a topic for several videos, most likely. But for now, suffice it to say we are just throwing uh, an exception with a message, cannot save record. So if I do that, instead of returning false, So I clicked edit. I'm gonna just clear the logs here. Click save. Now we see our error, although it's not pretty. We can see that before submit did get triggered, but then we see our cannot save record exception. We do not see after submit. So we have stopped this change from making it to the database. Now, even though nothing changed, our event, our user event still fired. So even if nothing changes on the record, as long as someone or something is trying to commit the record to the database, the user event will fire. Hopefully this illustration has given you a little better understanding of the events involved in a record's lifecycle. And uh, you've got a better handle on the tools that you will use to implement business logic. And that is it for this lesson. If you liked what you saw in this video, hit that thumbs up button, go share what you learned with somebody else. Click subscribe to stay up to date and become a confident, competent SweetScript developer yourself through my videos. And thanks for watching. Keep learning, keep sharing. I'll see you next time.